Mpati and I welcome you to Charter Accountants video lecture. What are objectives for the taxation of farmers? First, we're going to look at the provisions of the income taxes that are peculiar to farmers, namely the capital allowances and the reliefs, or special reliefs that are available to farmers. So again, big picture is that a farmer is a specialized taxpayer and therefore we need to look at what are the special issues that are relevant to the farmer. We should not forget that our gross income and general deductions are still the same and those principles will still apply. We're simply looking at the peculiarities that are specific to farmers. So why do farmers have special provisions that apply only to them? This is a question you should ask yourself. Why would the taxman have special provisions for farmers? Look at the nature of the work of farmers. What type of product are they producing? How long does it take them to produce? And how long does it take them to actually realize the money? So shouldn't there be a some sort of provisions that help farmers given the nature of the industry of farming? Given droughts that can strike them that have nothing to do with their way they actually have set up their businesses, but it's a uh, natural causes. How about if a pestilence strikes or a disease cuts across the whole country in terms of like foot to mouth? Should farmers not be have some sort of relief from such pestilences? And what type of allowance should they get given it's like a, quite a capital intensive industry, given if you are going to be farming productively on a piece of land, you'll need tractors, you'll need planters. There's a lot of infrastructure that you'll need to build in order for your farm to become productive. Therefore, should I not get more allowances as opposed to say someone who doesn't have a capital intensive work like a service industry? These are the questions. This is why then farmers became specialized taxpayers. So before we get into farming, we first need to look at section two definition of a farmer. So a farmer is anyone who derives income from pastoral, agricultural or farming activities, including income from the letting of a farm used for such purposes. This is the definition of a farmer as far as section two is concerned. Drilling deeper into this, we're looking at pastoral, agricultural or farming activities. What are those kind of activities? What does, when does one say one is involved in farming activities? A good question now will be to ask yourself, is someone like agri-foods a farmer? Does he not partake in agricultural activities or farming activities? They do have contract farmers, but the contract farming, farming activities per this definition? These are the questions you need to ask yourself and see whether agri-foods may be construed as a farmer as far as the act is concerned and therefore be able to get the special provisions or whatever deductions or allowances that are offered to farmers should be also applicable to agri-foods. Let's look at another one, Irvins. Is Irvins into farming activities? And if it is, will these allowances apply to Irvins as a farmer? Because it mainly says agricultural or other farming activities. What are other farming activities? Irvins, you know, does the old chickens, um, eggs, and it also rears those broiler chickens. So in that respect, are they not doing farming activities? Are these not pastoral activities by them keeping chickens, which we then buy, they then process and sell to you? How about the day old chicks they produce? What of the eggs? They have layers and they sell eggs. Are uh, rearing layer chickens not farming? So therefore, should they be allowed the allowances that go to farmers. These are the questions you need to ask yourself and come to the lecture and maybe ask, let's discuss this. How is it we then define a farmer? Now, once we're done defining a farmer and we agree who a farmer is, let us now look at the specific provisions that are applicable to these farmers. So we're looking at first the fourth schedule that talks of your capital allowances. And the first one you look at is the stuff housing. So fourth schedule paragraph one says buildings for staff housing are buildings used mainly for the purpose of a trade wholly or mainly for housing employees. 
It does not include any building comprising of residential unit that exceeds obviously your $25,000. And thus housing does not include a BRO forming part of a farm compound. This was part of a case law, which is 1511. So a BRO connected to a your staff housing is not included as far as staff housing is concerned. Although it might be part of the compound, the farm compound, it is not included in the value of the staff housing. And the allowance that are available to farmers as per the fourth schedule, we're looking specifically here at your capital allowances schedule, just like we did with your staff housing. These are farm improvements that are specific, that are allowable under your fourth schedule. These are your farm improvements, just which are defined as buildings or structures of a permanent nature used in farming operations. These may include sheds, canals, permanent roads, bridges, cattle dips, but does not include obviously your beer holes. Inclusions also into your farm improvements include schools, hospitals and clinics, but you're only allowed a capital allowance up to the 50%, which is limited. The capital allowance is limited to only 50%. The capital allowance is only applicable to 50% of the cost of the school, hospital, or clinic. Now, what is excluded here are farm assets that are covered by other specific provisions, mainly your seventh schedule assets. And staff housing and topographical bonds are also not included as far as the fourth schedule is concerned. Now, what is a tobacco ban as far as work on Zend and passes the fourth schedule? A tobacco ban means any building used for curing tobacco. Then let us look now at our more specifically to farming. With the fourth schedule, these were general capital allowances that are specific obviously to farmers because they're talking about farm improvements and staff housing that is involved in farming operations. But the seventh schedule gives us more assets or basically more allowances that a farmer is allowed to look at. Now the seventh schedule specifically covers your drought relief, epidemic relief, certain expenditures that are allowable as far as the farmer is concerned and other assets in the likes of fencing and water conservation work. Now you're going to have to go through your seventh schedule and look at the definitions of each of these things. What does it mean that an area has been drought stricken? What are the requirements for an area to be said to be drought stricken or even epidemic has come across? And which expenditures are we looking at when we're talking about allowable deductions as far as farmers are concerned? When the seventh schedule defines a particular expenditure that will be deductible in full as because it has been incurred by a farmer. Then obviously, what is water conservation work? Is a farrow water conservation work or bowl or maybe a reservoir? What is water conservation work? We need to go read the definition in our legislation, which is the seventh schedule. Properly unpack it and look at the possible things that could meet that definition. Now let's go into a little depth here. A farmer shall be entitled to deduct expenditure incurred on First and foremost, water conservation work. Expenditure is deductible in the year incurred, notwithstanding the work might be in progress. So whenever you're expending or working on water conservation work, in other words, maybe say building a reservoir, the cost of building that reservoir is actually deductible for a farmer. Although, again, the reason why it's been put specifically in the seventh schedule means it might not necessarily meet the definition as far as section 15 is concerned and why it might be that you will need to understand why these particular assets have been allowed and whether they meet the general deduction formula because if they do meet the general deduction formula do you think the zimra or the taxman would then have to create a specific provision for them it means more than likely these assets or these costs we're talking about do not meet the section 15 deduction formula hence why i've got a specific provision that then allows you if that person is a farmer and if they have incurred the expenditure that has been explained. So another one is the sinking of bowls and wells. This is allowed as a deduction in full when it is incurred by the farmer. 
fencing is another deduction that's around. When you fence your farm area, the deduction, the expenditure, must not only be incurred by the taxpayer, but the fencing must be used in farming operations. So when a farmer buys a farm and covers his land or at least starts to fence his land, the cost of that fence or the fencing is actually deductible. Although it might have an enduring benefit, it still is deductible because it's a specific provision under the seventh schedule for deducting the cost for fencing. Stamping, obviously, and clearing land are other ones. Works for prevention of soil erosion is also deductible. And area on the ge geographical surveys. These expenses do not necessarily meet the Section 15 model of deduction and therefore have been given specific deduction under your seventh schedule. Stamping and clear rank, obviously, when you're going to start to farm, you're going to have to clear the land. Those costs are deductible, although by clearing a land, you're creating an enduring benefit for the farmer. Same with the uh, works that prevent erosion. Again, the, the, once you have done some work to prevent erosion, excuse me, I am able to breed the rewards over time. So it means enduring benefit. However, it, because it's a farmer, it will be then an allowable deduction. So now that we've dealt with this particular assets, let's go to another asset that is a prob is an area of concern for farmers, livestock. So what if I'm in the rearing of cattle or sheep? What value should I actually use? As of course, this in this case for the farmer, that livestock is his inventory. Do you understand why it's inventory as far as the farmer is concerned? It's an asset that I buy and sell, just as if I was in a shop, the rice, the biscuits, the meat that OK sells as inventory, so too it is for a farmer when he's rearing cattle. But because of the nature of farming, remember I can keep, I can take care or rear a cow for a upward of maybe four or five years before I actually sell it off. So as far as inventory is concerned, we know it's usually sold within a year. How then do I account for that value as far as my income tax return is concerned? So what the service schedule tells us is how to value ordinary livestock. So we're looking mainly at livestock that you paid for. So the farmer has an election in the first return he does when it comes to livestock. He can either choose a fixed standard value or the cost of maintenance value to include in his gross income or actually allow as a deduction. So how do these months work? For stud livestock, he can elect not you can elect your purchase price value, PPV, or your fixed standard value. Which one he elects now will depend on what he's looking for. So this is an area of tax planning, possibilities on how to make my tax paying more efficient. Now, how do you look at these fixed standard value, cost of maintenance, purchase price value? Let us look at them and study them through an example. So you have Ms. Mandengu in Bindura, who is a livestock farmer. She has provided you with the following details concerning her livestock. So in January 2015, she had the following animals at her farm. Two bulls, 35 cows, 12 calves, 8 tollies, 17 oxen, and 23 heifers. During the year, there were movements as far as these, the stock was concerned. What was the movement? So... One bull, three cows, and ten heifers were purchased during the year. Twenty cows were born during the year. Seven heifers grew into cows. Four tollies became oxen. Eleven cows became tollies. And seven cows became heifers. One of the bulls died due to what we call black leg. And two oxen were slaughtered during the year. Three cows, nine oxen, and six heifers were sold during the year. And a bull was purchased for eight hundred dollars so how are we going to account for this all this livestock and all these movements these were recorded in her books obviously now the company has the following standard values for its stock 
These are standard values for the livestock. We've got $220 for each cow I own, $400 for an oxen, $254 heifers, $200 for tollies, and $80 for cows. So because these are fixed standard values, these are values you'll more than likely find at Zimra. So you have to go ask them to write the standard, what is the fixed standard value for this particular livestock? Now, if this is more efficient for you to use, you might use fixed standard value, but if it's not, maybe cost of maintenance might be a better method to use for you. So, but as far as Ms. Mandengu is concerned, how is she going to value her livestock? So, in, the required here is to calculate the value of her closing stock for Ms. Mandengu at what? 31 December 2015. We're going to have to do a schedule to find out at 31 December. How many cows, oxen, heifers, tollies, or calves did Mrs. Mandengu have? So we're going to have an opening balance, go through whatever movements happened within that, and then we come up with a closing balance for the particular area of livestock. And then if we're using FSV, multiply that amount by the FSV. So... How about now if I acquire my livestock without necessarily paying for it? So for instance, most farmers could have inherited that farm. Or maybe there was livestock that was donated to the farm. How does the legislation help us in this regard? So what legislation says, when you get donations either through inheritance or donations, when you get livestock when you through inheritance or donations, First and foremost, you have to ask yourself, if the heir or the donee merely sells the livestock without conducting farming operations, the proceeds are of a capital nature. What does this mean to me? So, I inherited a farm from my father, but I didn't use any of the livestock on that farm for farming operations. I didn't conduct any farming operations. I simply sold them off as soon as I inherited them. So, in that regard, that livestock is no longer of inventory. But now more, it's just an inheritance I've made. Therefore, when I sell it, the proceeds from that are of a capital nature. Why is it of a capital nature? That's a question you have to ask yourself in the discussion. So when you look at capital nature, was my intention for profit making or not? Was my intention, was this fixed or floating capital that I earned? What was the intention of me when I sold them? Was it just a fortuitous profit? What is the nature of the sale? So when it comes to a donee who simply inherits and sells them off without doing farming operations, can we say that these assets were floating capital? He was using them for business and on a regular basis. No, it was a once of sale, therefore capital in nature. There were no operations that were conducted by the A or donee. But if he does conduct farming operations, what does it say? If livestock or farming is commenced or livestock introduced into existing farming operations, a deduction will be allowable. Now, these will now become revenue nature and therefore deductible because now we are doing farming operations. We are now a farmer. Therefore, the livestock is no longer capital but revenue, but inventory, which is revenue nature. Therefore, whatever livestock is included or what becomes an allowable deduction. Now, this is a repeat of our last slide. Let's look at an example. So, Varimi Farmers is a, a, is a farm that was acquired in Manekaland in 2013 under the government-sponsored A2 resettlement scheme and immediately commenced crop farming operations. The following company, the company paid for an amount of $90,000 allocated, allocated to farm improvements of the farm as follows. For land, nothing paid as far as farm improvements are concerned. For staff housing, there were five units where he paid $20,000 for those improvements. Tobacco band fifteen thousand, dam eighteen thousand, irrigation equipment twelve thousand, and farm tractors twenty five thousand. The following expenditures were incurred during the course of the year: for stumping and clearing the land four thousand, sinking bore and well six thousand, new fencing 
to replace the old fence was 5,000 and I bought farming equipment worth 14,000. So the income statement for the year ended 31 December 2013 reflected a net profit of 30,000. And within this net profit, what was included expenses such as depreciation of 8,500, crop chemicals of 7,800, farm expenses of 14,000, and there was also a late payment of payee for 2,000. Calculate the minimum taxable income or the maximum tax loss for the year ended 31st December 2013 for Morimi farmers. So how do you go about it? We're going to have to look at this. Start obviously from the net profit were given and then adjust it for items that should not be included in tax, your exemptions from tax, your prohibited deductions, and non-taxable items. So because it's a farmer, obviously let's start at the 30,000. Now depreciation we said is a, obviously is it a taxable amount or not? Should we be allowed a deduction as far as for depreciation? These are normal gross, principle, gross income principles. Let's look back and try, remember what we did for general deduction formula. Does depreciation meet that formula? Obviously the answer will be no. Why is it no? Because obviously depreciation was not incurred as far as tax is concerned. Therefore, we need to add that back. Our payee penalty, is that a deductible expense? Why is it, if it's not deductible, why is it not deductible? Well, we did incur it, so for why would it not? Again, we need to look maybe at prohibited deductions, which prohibit certain penalties from being deducted because of their nature. So we add again, add back payee penalties. Obviously, you need to reduce that by our capital allowances. What are the capital allowance allowed for staff housing? Again, we're into allowance of 5%, your tobacco bonds, because remember, these are improvements and not constructed. And look for your fourth schedule, what it states. Then we look at seven schedule deductions, which include your stamping and carrying, your sinking of bowls, and your new fencing. These are all part of your seven schedule deductions and your farm equipment, remember, does not in, is not included in the seven schedule, so will not be deductible and that will be of a capital nature. Why? Because tractors have enduring benefit and I have spent money on fixed capital. Then we find that the taxable income for this farmer would be 11,000 and that is what our, tech, what our required assets to do. So what is important is to realize which assets are covered under the seventh schedule, which assets are covered under the fourth schedule, and what are the percentages as far as capital allowances for farmers are concerned. It might be different when it comes to normal companies, so be careful there, especially with your seventh schedule deductions, because most of the seventh schedule assets, remember, have not been included in the fourth schedule, hence why they have been included in the seventh. And how much is in allowed is the full amount of that expenditure, where sometimes with uh, capital allowances, it might not be the full amount. So be careful when it comes to farmers in that regard as far as capital allowances and seven schedule allowances concerned. Now let's look at other deductions that have come around when we look at seventh schedule, your drought relief. Now what's important is to understand the definition of a drought and when can one say a drought has occurred. Remember, there's a specific requirement in that the minister has to have declared the particular region the farm is in a drought region. Otherwise, you will not be able to use this drought relief. So what happens when we look at the seventh schedule as far as drought relief is concerned? If your cattle die or you are forced to sell them because of a drought, you get a certain amount of receive, relief, which is per your paragraph five. So how you work this out is simply the proceeds from the drought sales list, the number of cows that you sold times its fixed standard value, and B, the total number sold times livestock expenses over the average livestock. These are the deductions you'll make from the proceeds. And the taxable income from drought sales will be, obviously, your proceeds less those two costs, which is your fixed under value times number of livestock sold plus your total number sold 
times your livestock expenses over your average stock to get the average expenditure as far as livestock is concerned. These will be deducted from the proceeds, which will give us your taxable income from dial sales. And our relief will be two thirds of this amount will be able to be carried forward into the next year. So that it will, that amount will be included in next year's gross income. So in this year, we'll only be taxed on a third of the taxable income as far as drought sales are concerned. And remember, average life, average stock is opening plus closing divided by two, which will give us the average number of stock that we've held during the year. Now let's look at an example. A farmer sold in a drought proclaimed area 25 oxen where he realized an amount of 9,000. His fixed out and value for oxen is $300 and the direct herd expense, what he, the expense he had for the direct herd was $1,500. Opening stock for the year was 160 and his closing stock was 148. So <coughs> applying our formula, drought sales was $9,000, right? Uh, fixed standard value for the number of cat livestock sold. How many do we sell? 25 oxen. Multiply by what? Your $300 as fixed standard value, you get 7,500. For your expenses, herd expenses, we say we incurred 1,500 multiplied by obviously the number of cattle we sold, which is 25 divided by the average livestock, which will be 160 plus 140, which is 300, divided by 2, which is 150. So our average expenditure there would be 250. Add those expenditures together and less them from our 9,000. We get the taxable income for drought sales being 1,250, but we do have a relief in terms of two thirds of that amount. So what will be included in my taxable income for the current year will be 417 as far as those drought sales are concerned. Now we have a second example. So go through it and see whether you can see what, how to work it out, applying our similar formula. In other words, proceeds, less your fixed standard value of the of the kettle that have been sold, less obviously your livestock expenses, which will be your total expenses, your expenses per head divided by the average livestock of the cows in the year, and the relief will be the two thirds of that sale. We also get a, what we call a restocking allowance as far as the seven schedule is concerned. So after a drought is hit, and now we are recovering from that drought, we can also restock our, our livestock. So I have taken a hit. The taxman realizes that because of the nature of farming, nature can actually take a toll on a farmer. So when he does restock, we should actually give him a bit of an allowance. So provided what it says is that paragraph six of your herd of your legislation says provided on the cost of restocking a herd which has been depleted based on for sales so you're either epidemic or drought the cost of those purchases are allowed and a further 50 percent of the purchase price is granted as a restocking allowance so restocking allowance is subject to a restriction based obviously on the sales capacity of the land your accl so what basically paragraph six is saying is if you have been forced to sell your stock during a drought on epidemic and now you are restocking will allow you obviously the purchase price of those livestock you've purchased but on top of that we allow you an additional 50 percent of that cost as an allowance you can deduct but this obviously is restricted based on the carrying capacity of the land. So how does this work now? Let us look at an example. In September 2010, a farmer purchased 70 heifers for $30,000, thereby restocking his herd, which had been depleted by drought. 
the assessed carrying capacity of the land has been determined to be 300 head of cattle. So the farmer's livestock trading account for the year ended 31 December 2010 is as follows. His opening stock was 350, which had $70,000. He then purchased 70 in September for 30,000. He had expenses of 4,000 as far as the herd was concerned and made a profit of 25,000. In April, he sold cattle worth 100, 100 kettle and realized 65,000. And closing head now is 320 kettle with a value of 64,000. So let us work out what his allow, restocking allowance is. I said, can you provide 300? On hand prior to the purchase, you had 250. Difference which would have, which should not have been exceeded is 50 kill. So potential restocking allowance, we have 15,000, which is 50 times your 300 kettle. $300 for your fixed end value. That's your potential restocking allowance. Actual allowance would be the 50 kettle divided by the 70 you added times obviously that restocking allowance as a proportional value. And you get your restocking allowance being 10,714. Agreed? It's limited to your assets carrying capacity. So you can only get allowance for 50 of the kettle. But how much is that 50 of the kettle? What we know is that how much we spent on the kettle, which was 15,000. Therefore, what potentially, if it was 50, what should we have spent? You find that you should have spent actually 10,714. And that's what you'll be allowed as restocking allowance. I hope that if there are any questions, please bring them to your lecture. Come prepared. I hope you watch this video and actually attempt some of the end of any questions as far as farming is concerned. So you come with preloaded questions to the lecture. Good luck with your studies and thank you very much for listening to me.